Okay, thanks for coming. I plan to talk about very modest mathematical objects, points and lines and so on, and more precisely incidences between them, and even more precisely incidences between the subspaces generated by a choice of finite collection of points in projective space. So the slide is my projective plane, and pick your favorite collection of points. Let me pick four general points in the plane. And what I'm interested in is the incidences generated by this choice. So what I would do is to connect every pair of points by a line to generate six lines joining four points. So there are four points and six lines. Of course, if you pick different collection of points, you will generate different incidences. So if you pick the fourth point and move it into a little bit more special position, then the incidence you're going to generate will be of this form, where you have four points and four lines. If you increase the number of points, then you can start creating genuinely new and interesting incidences. For example, if I have pick very carefully this collection of seven points, which is very far from being generic, then the incidence that you will going to create will look like this. So there are nine lines generated by the choice of seven points. Well, you can pick any one or some of the points and move it into even more special position, changing your structure of the incidence. But you can do even more something interesting, namely that you can move the characteristic of your base field. So you pick your prime, P, and drag it to the prime 2. Then something funny happens to the incidence between the three red points. So at the limit, where your P becomes 2, the three red points become collinear. And you have dropped the number of lines from 9 to 7. So in this picture, you see 7 points and 7 lines. P is the characteristic of the field that defines my projective plane. So this is the projective plane over a field with two elements. So at this point, you may be identify a pattern between the number of points and the number of lines generated by them. The number of points is always at most the number of lines. Of course, there is a single exception where all the points you have chosen lie on a single line. But except that, every time you generate many lines. So this is perhaps what may be the first theorem in enumerative combinatorial geometry in the 40s by De Bruijn and Erdish, which says that for every choice of points, E in a projective plane, determines at least the size of E lines, unless your set E is contained in a line. But there is no reason to stop at the projective plane. You can, you can go higher dimension. So let's think about projective spaces. So this is maybe the most basic and the most important information in P3, that of four general points. Here, you start generating incidences of the form points, lines, and planes. So there are four points, and these generate six lines, and these generate four planes. So the number that we are interested in here is 464. If you pick a fifth, if you put a fifth point in a generic position, then the numbers will be 5, 10, and 10. And if you move the fifth point into a slightly more special position so that it lies on one of the planes already generated, then the number will be 5, 10, 7. And if you drag the fifth point to, into even more special position so that it lies in one of the lines already created, then the number will be 
585. So there's, in this case, just like the case of the funnel plane, there's a tie between the number of points and the number of planes. But you can never do better than that by the theorem of Mutskin and others, which says that the theorem that you have seen by Dubuzhin and Nerdish, the obvious analog holds in arbitrary dimension. The number of hyperplanes determined by a configuration of points in a projective space is always at least the number of points unless all the points are contained in a single hyperplane. On a fixed projective space of given dimension, take say oh, 17. Yeah. Now, point configuration of points. You can choose to think about dually a hyperplane arrangement. But one of the classic but uh, very nice result due to Green in the 70s, in some sense, tells us why this inequality holds. I mean, the previous theorems asserts that one number is larger than the other number, and these numbers are cardinalities of some sets. And there is only one reason why this is true. The reason being that there is an injection from one set to the other. But it's not an arbitrary injection. Of course, the injection should come from naturally from the given, should respect the given structure, meaning that if you write L1, for the set of points, and L to the d minus 1 for the set of hyperplanes determined by those points, there must be an injection going from one set to the other, which respects the incidences. So in other words, for every point in your collection E, you can choose a hyperplane containing that point so that no hyperplane is chosen twice. So combinatorially says that, say that, there is a matching from the set of points to the set of hyperplanes. So what about flats of other dimensions? So let's, let's use the language of linear algebra. Let's start with a spanning subset of a d-dimensional vector space over some field. And let's write L for the partially ordered set of subspaces spanned by subsets of E. And let's write LP for the set of p-dimensional spaces in L. So if I have four general vectors in A3, which corresponds to four general points in projective plane, my numbers will be 1, 4, 6, 1. The zero subspace, one-dimensional spaces, two-dimensional spaces, and the entire space. The, yeah, yeah. Yes. So the statement you said, you said for every point, I can pick a, a side of the tangent. Yes. But it would seem that there's obvious symmetries which prevent there from being a preferred way. Sure, yeah, that's the interesting point. And that maybe I should address that. So what, what can be expected in general? So the so-called top-heavy conjecture says that if d is dimension of your space, then for every p less than d half, you have this inequality. So LP, the size, is at most the size of L to the D minus P. More precisely, there is a good reason for this. There is a matching, meaning an injective map going from LP to L to the D minus P, respecting the incidence. Similarly, if you have for every P less than D half, LP should be at most LP plus one, and there is a matching witness in this fact. Let's just concentrate on the second part. In the trivial case, where it corresponds to simplex or the tetrahedron, your L would be the Boolean lattice. It says that the binomial coefficients will increase up to middle, and there is a matching witnessing them. But you will see that even in that trivial case, it's not exactly trivial to construct a matching of this form. They exist, but there is no way of constructing this matching while preserving the democracy between the points. You have to sort of choose it in a fuzzy way, fixing an artificial ordering on the underlying set or something like that. Sometimes that's what happens, but oftentimes it indicates that there is some other structure you should look at. And our result says that this conjecture is true. 
And, and if you happen to know me, uh, then you will probably be able to guess how the proof works because no matter what problem I have, I always use one same tool. So proof is by hart Lepshit theorem. What we do is the following. You start with this post set L and you construct a certain commutative graded algebra. I am not going to tell you how the multiplication works in this graded algebra, but it has a distinguished basis, one for each element of L, also considering the graded dimensions. And what we do is that if we write L to the sum of all the points, elements in L1, then the repeated multiplication by this L defines an injection from pth graded piece to the d minus pth graded piece. Okay, so maybe it's not a great idea to tell you how the proof works in three minutes, but maybe in this room I have a chance. Yeah, so four minutes. four minutes, great. I even have a greater chance, considering the fact that probably this is the room with highest concentration of people who knows about decomposition theorem for perverse sheaves in this galaxy. So I'm still not assuming that you know what that is, but you don't really have to know it. Let me just sketch how the proof flows. What we do is, as a first step, construct the map between smooth projective variety going from x to y. So the dimension of x is d, the dimension of your vector space, and dimension of y is the number of points. Well, by construction, which is just another way of viewing, thinking about configuration of points in projective space, it comes equipped with an isomorphism going from our graded algebra, B, that we want to say something about, with the image of the pullback map in cohomology from Y to that of X. And under this isomorphism, our what would be a Lepschitz element L, the sum of all the points, so to speak, corresponds to some natural ample divisor on Y, the target. So what do you do? So whenever you're given a map between projective variety, you try to apply something. In my case, the decomposition theorem. It says that the di direct image of the constant sheaf split as a direct sum the intersection complex of the image with some other junk. And if I take the cohomology of both sides, then I see this well-known fact that the intersection cohomology of the image of my map F injects into the cohomology of X. But this injection is not any injection. It's coming from the level of sheaves, so I know that it preserves the module structure. In our case, I can say that the injection from the intersection cohomology to the cohomology of X is a module homomorphism over the cohomology of Y. So if I combine these two facts, then I notice that my algebra of interest, the one constructed from combinatorics, is isomorphic to a HY submodule of IHFX. But I know something about IH of FX. Although FX is usually very singular, I know that its intersection cohomology should satisfy hart lepshot theorem. And one thing nice about hart lepshot theorem is that it says something is bijective. In particular, it says it's injective. But injective maps restricts to injective maps. So uh, if I have a submodule of it, then I'll get the automatically injective mapping. So let me conclude with how you would get from the statement that certain linear map is injective to go from this combinatorial matching. So this vector space, this Q vector space, has a distinguished basis consisting of p-dimensional subspaces. And the target has d minus p-dimensional <coughs> subspaces. So I write this map as a matrix. By the way how multiplication works, this matrix has a very nice 0, 1 pattern. So label the columns with the p-dimensional spaces and the 
rows with the coding P spaces. And the matrix will have zero whenever the two pair are not incident to each other. And whenever you have that, and I see that my map is injective, meaning that my matrix is full rank, so that I have a non-zero subdeterminant somewhere of full size. And the fact that that determinant being non-zero should be witnessed by one term in the standard expansion of the determinant, which corresponds to a permutation going from the p-dimensional spaces to some subset of code in p spaces. That is your injection. But of course, there is no reason to prefer some term of the determinant expression to some other term. But that's what it is. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you.